quarters are always expensive. That's been consistent. <laughs> I'm consistent. Uh, Gordon Soderberg, uh, Veterans Green uh, Project right around the corner. Just going to play clusters. Good morning, Marcus Barnes. Uh, I love on Prevost. Just a guy trying to create positive, sustainable change. Robert Patterson from the from the Grand Montague Community Association. The boss of the household. I need a hand. That's my wife, Diane. <laughs> oh man, if we had anybody be missed. We had two just walking in the front rooms, going around, introducing ourselves. Hey, mom. I'm sorry. Uh, Carol Jenkins, 40th Street Black Club between Eaton and Shell Farm. Why do you introduce yourself so soft when you speak? I don't oh, care. Well, you already know when I have to <laughs> but, use my real voice. <laughs> <laughs> this woman's putting on the front for all of you. <laughs> Good morning, Andrea Cartwright. I am here with some Delta Sigma Theta of the Detroit alumni chapter. Okay, well, we have one more. Hi, I'm Pat Purnell Shelton with Fillmore Street Block Club. I'm also a board member with the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Thank you for coming on out. We have our NPOs in the back, our new NPOs. We'll go ahead and give them a quick shout out. One of them will come to the front and introduce themselves. We're trying to make them more uh, familiar faces in the, in the uh, district. They're making faces in me. They're making faces in me. going to get chalk. Good morning, everybody. I'm off. Well, let me come on. to the front, man. I'm Officer Gordon. Number All of them. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Officer Wesley. I'm new appointed uh, off the MPO for the 8th Precinct in this area here at Kimo. Some familiar faces. If you guys have any questions or concerns regarding uh, quality of life issues, make sure you introduce yourselves to the MPO in the area. Uh, their information will be up there on the flyers very soon. And good morning, everyone. I'm Officer Heather Ivy of the 6th Precinct. I handle everything west of Evergreen between, between Warren and the school craft. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have one more. No, yeah. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm trying to figure out the flow of things, but um, Andre Smith, I'm a CEO of the American RAC, uh, which was founded by my father, William Mary. You want to come in and say something? Hello, everyone. Hello. Where's the camera? Right here. Okay, my fault. My name is William McMurray. I'm the founder of RAC, Restoring American Confidence. We make firearm storage devices to keep firearms safe so children can't access them, so that your firearm cannot be stolen in your vehicle or in your home. Uh, we're very dedicated to the city of Detroit and our nation to, to reduce the number of firearm accidents, firearm deaths, injuries by guns getting in the wrong hands. We're gonna be working with Councilman Tate's office and we're gonna have some upcoming safety, education and prevention events that's going to allow you to, to know us better. So thank you so much. Thank you. Let me say a round of applause for a really diverse group here with us today. Uh, without further ado, I want to bring up our very own Councilman James Tanks. So please join him, join me, and give him a round of applause, please. That's enough. Appreciate it. 
as I always say, we can have a meeting and no one shows up and we'll just be here by ourselves. So it's always a blessing to see folks who are here in the room. Um, new faces, brand new, first time being here at this particular room. Also, I know I see some new faces. Um, familiar faces, but first time in this particular meeting. So I thank you all for being here. The way that the, the meeting goes is that there are no such thing as strange, weird. Well, I was moving this, this, this camera. It was kind of weirdly in my way. <laughs> um, there's no such thing as a bad question, strange question, hard question. Uh, we just want to make sure that we are able to answer as many questions as we can and provide any answers, but also understanding that I don't have all the answers. And some of the people in the room are going through or have gone through some of the same stuff that you're going through in your neighborhood, in your household, and the answer may be sitting right next to you, not sitting up here on the stage. So that's why we want to make sure that we put whatever out here. Now, if you have something that you have and you want to keep it personal and private, uh, we will make sure we take that information as well. Aaron there, we have Daniela there, um, and anyone from the team will get that information from you and uh, move it forward. Um, but this is what we have, it's an open forum. And so uh, we'd like to begin first, if we can, give a shout out to uh, Java House, y'all, for allowing us to be here every first and third Friday. That is tremendous. Um, we just ask for the love from the community, and then you all show up. Miss Alicia, you got you want to say a few words? Because we would love to have you say a few words. Because you know we got a special <laughs> evening, like something special tonight. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Oh, oh, how's everybody? Oh, 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 What's up, honey? You got your own mic. That's what's up. Did you like that? I came in with my own mic. Have a little fun, you know. The Lord is up in here today. I love it. Good morning, District One. Welcome to Java House. Um, thank you, Councilman Tate, the team, everybody for always coming here. Um, we are good at getting things done here in District One. And so, give yourself a round of applause for that. Your commitment of coming here, knowing what's going on in the community, um, is recognizable. Um, and so there's more things to come. Um, I'm Alicia. My sister over here is Tynesha. This is the Java House. Tonight is Jazz at Java with our very own Kevin Kev. Kevin Kev. friends. So tonight is going to be good. Um, we want to do something different. We want to spice it up for you all. We want to take all your comments and your suggestions and make it just a fun night. Six o'clock, we're going to open the doors. Mom is going to be doing some uh, good old mama uh, delicious dishes. I think Innocence can testify to that. That's right, <laughs> So come on in for some fun, some music with Kev. The friends, we have some special guests coming tonight, little poetry, the spoken word, jazz, vocalist, conversation, and just a good time right here in our neighborhood in District 1 in the Old Redford community. So thank you, and have a great day, and I'll see you tonight. We go for my friend, my sister, the owner of this establishment, Miss Alicia George. For real, like two man cups. Miss Alicia George. There we go. Much better, much better, much better. All right, so uh, again, we're going to start uh, Q and A. We have also today, as you know, is First Friday. Every First Friday, we like to have an interview of what is considered by some a uh, quote unquote dirty job. It's a job, it's not necessarily dirty, but it's a job that a lot of people don't want. It's a job that we don't have uh, much knowledge of, and the little knowledge we do have of it sometimes is negative, and it's just, uh, we don't, want, but we're glad that somebody does it. So today we have a very special guest, and we're going to bring him up shortly, but before we do that, we're going to have uh, some interaction, some engagement, and some Q&A. So we'll start over on this side, so good morning. Aaron has the microphone. You know, a couple questions. Uh, the Charter Commission meeting, is there going to be an intermediary or someone separate to run? Kind of calm things down? A yes. Bit? yes. Uh, so, no, they're an elected body. They're that, the citizens of the city of Detroit elected to be in that position. And so they're looking right now to hire an executive director. That executive director would then essentially be at their back and call. So they do the things that the board, uh, the commission as a whole, 
would like them to do. How, how many of you watched some or, or attended some of the charter commission meetings? Raise your hand. All right, so you got to make sure we pay attention to what's going on with the charter commission. Why? Why is it important for folks to know about what's going on with the charter commission? Uh, essentially, it sets the uh, it sets the rules and guidelines. For the city is going to operate for the next X amount of years. I'm not sure when the next vote will be. Okay, ten. Thank you. Okay, for for our ten years. So, very important. Um, and it's just been kind of like a circus, you know. So in regards to the to the Roberts Rule of Order, I didn't know if it would allow to have someone independent to run the meeting so that the commissioners can, excuse me, effectively uh, do their uh, duties. But you know, as you as you were saying, hopefully the executive director can can handle that. Well, again, the executive director will be chosen by the commission, okay. similar to where we have. Uh, what's called the Legislative Policy Division which is within the City Council. We have a director of the Legislative Policy Division and that person essentially um, executes the actions that we ask them to execute, period. And so they're not the one that will be able to cur curtail or contain some of the stuff that we see going on at that particular meeting. I do, again, encourage you all to pay attention. Now, what, what will happen is They'll come up, they have two years to come up with a new charter or amendments. After that two-year period is up, they'll come before the voters, whatever comes out of that, that two-year period, or maybe shorter. But whatever they come up with and they vote upon as a commission will come before the voters and they will have to vote upon it. So it's important for us, there may be like 12 things we like and one thing we really don't like. There may be six things we like and eight things we really don't like. So it could be a whole mixture of things, but right now is the time for folks like you to get involved in the process because they're shaping what that looks like now. And um, I remember 2010, 11, some of the same folks that are down there, they used to come to city council meetings. They used to yell and scream. Uh, some of them get put out. That, and I told the chair that that's what's gonna have to happen with some of those folks. Um, but when you have, unfortunately, this uh, ugly division amongst even the the, 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 count, the uh, commissioners, mm -hmm. it makes it even more difficult to get control of the audience. But that is the role of the chair, and so the chair has to do that. So, but the biggest, um, I think the, the biggest change agent of that process are you all. Yeah. When you show up, is what you will allow and what you will not allow. That's right. Is what you will tolerate as a community, what you will not tolerate. So. Um, the next, does anyone have the, the, do you have the information on the next charter commission meeting? Because we'll get that, Daniela or um, Aisha, can we find the next charter commission meeting? They typically have it on the same day, I know the major meeting, um, on the same day we have our District 1 our monthly meetings on the fourth Saturday. But there's another meeting that's coming up. They do have it broken down into uh, different you're not down there, watch the video because they do have someone at some point streaming the video. We're working on it as well from the city of Detroit standpoint. Uh, we're going to be submitting from the uh, we have it, we're right now working on a work group um, because something that's in my head and something that I want to do, my other eight colleagues may not want to see and want to do. So we have to, amongst ourselves, come together and figure out what are those asks, so to speak. And they may or may not take them up, but we have to at least try. Thank you. And one, one other question. Um, I didn't get a chance to see the segment, but apparently uh, on the local news they did a, a piece on um, when you contact emergency services and the uh, wait time with that. And I guess it was, uh, um, there was an issue between someone maybe on the police commissioner and the assistant chief last night where they, they were going to head up, which I think Craig should really spoke to that. So I will leave here. Um, perhaps the city council can have the chief, if it's under your purview, to speak to that segment. Um, because in my position, it shouldn't have really been the assistant chief to let to have that conversation with the local television. It should have came from the chief chief out on down. So, so, so the, the way, we go with this charter again, the way the charter works, See, this is a strong mayor form of government. 
So the mayor runs all of the departments. So we make suggestions. Chief Craig, you should have been there. That's, again, just an opinion. That's all we have. That's the only authority we have to make that recommendation. That would have to come from the mayor that says, okay, Chief, you are the one that will be um, conducting this interview. Maybe the chief wasn't in town. I don't know. Maybe it was an issue that he said, uh, here's my right hand, and this is someone who I think has the most uh, knowledge about it because that's their responsibility as an individual in that department. So there's a whole bunch of different factors as to why. You know, sometimes I won't be up here. Uh, I'll have my staff, my team, they'll come up here and conduct this meeting. So it's a whole bunch of different reasons. The issue, though, is the chief of police to figure out. And so what we're doing right now is identifying, we're about to approach the budget season, uh, which will begin next week, as a matter of fact. Uh, the budget is two, about two months long process. We're going to go through each and every department within the city of Detroit and identify what dollars you need, what dollar, and what have you been doing with the dollars that we provided. And so some of those dollars will potentially go towards hiring new uh, 911 operators. And that's probably a big problem. But then another piece to it is we need more police officers. And without having enough manpower on the street, uh, it does compromise our ability to cover it effectively. So we're working on a whole bunch of different mechanisms to increase both of those areas, but it's not just an easy fix. And it's not one you can just throw money at either. You throw money at and folks leave, and now it's another hole that you got to fill. So it's a... In press conferences and things, but it, you know, maybe at your community meeting that you attend, uh, maybe you invite him out and have him yeah, that's a good point. come and invite uh, and, and give some responses. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. That doesn't apply to me. <laughs> I just wanted to comment on the family dollar that's located on Grand River at Four Year. Uh, they've been working to improve it. It's been a process for the past three weeks, and they're having a reopening on Saturday. Um, they uh, submitted coupons throughout the neighborhood where you could get $5 off uh, if you purchase $20 or $25. Merch, uh, worth of merchandise uh, and also I took a little stroll through there yesterday uh, it has improved but they realized that they have a lot more work to do and they I did talk to the uh, assistant district uh, manager and also the manager of the store and there's two managers of the store so if you have any comments or any compliments feel free to indicate them uh, to the store manager because they need to know if they're uh, improving. Okay, thank you. So I know you gave out, Ms. Carroll, I know you gave yes. out the uh, phone number to that district manager. Yes, I did. Uh, last time you were here. Yes. Uh, is that number still a good number to give? Oh, that's first? an excellent number. Okay. And that person will potentially be able to address some of the concerns. Family dollar? Yes. Or dollar tree? No, this is family, family dollar. dollar. So, yes. So that, that district manager will potentially be able to address some of those uh, issues at any uh, of the family dollars in this area. For this particular okay. district, right. right. So mm -hmm. do you want to give out that number again? Sure. Just in case? Like I said, I don't have the answers, but I'm your neighbor. And is actually getting some change as a result of her getting involved. Okay, his name is Jeff Blakely. That's B L A K E L E Y. And his phone number is 248-392-1365. And I also have him working on the store that's located on Grand River and Evergreen. Uh, because it's hideous. And that's it. Oh, and also I just wanted to compliment your staff. Um, and the Department of Neighborhoods for removing the blight and dump that I had located on Eaton between Winthrop and Foyer Street. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, too. All right. Next up. Yeah, we'll take your hand out. We'll take your hand out.
Um, I'm Betty Nance. I'm a community advocate uh, for O'Hare as well. But uh, I have just one little concern. Um, when you come into the city um, on Grand River and Seven Mile, uh, across from the um, sorority house, um, it's been, I know it's winter time, but it was happening even last year and it was a concern of mine. And um, right there, you see the Welcome to Detroit sign. And it is hideous. And it needs to be cleaned. It needs to be done. Uh, because when you come in, we don't want the city to be known as filthy, dirty, and that's our image. So because it's a city property, it needs to be done by the city. And I don't know uh, what the boundary is and where the next sign is. But if that needs to be taken care of as well, we want our boundaries to look just like any other suburb when you come into it. So we know the one at Grand River and Seven Mile. It is, you can't even tell, it says, welcome to Detroit. You don't and think I, it's just because of the winter? It's no, it's not because of winter. And I'm sure anybody who has seen it, they know as well. You can't even tell it says, welcome to Detroit. It is good, it's scummed, it's, deep, it's filthy. It, it's probably been there a while. And has it's been, been there uh, for years. Uh, just, it's been there for years. So, well, you know, and, and I travel that area all the time. It's one of those things where it becomes wall thing. You just drive by it. Yeah, and, and, by, and it's constantly, it, and, uh, well, I've noticed, and people have noticed, and it's getting worse and worse. So we just want it looked at and cleaned and updated. And uh, if there's any more, maybe they can check into those as well. Because when you come into our city, we want the same reflection as you get from other city limits. Yes, ma'am. So, Daniela, we will put that on our list for DPW, um, Seven Mile, and um, Grand, Grand River. River. So and welcome to Detroit Side. Yes. The yes. Clean welcome to Detroit yes, Side. Yes, because we want our image to look just like everyone else. We don't, we don't want filth when we come into our city. Flowers around. Yeah. With with flowers around. It. <laughs> yes. 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 We want the image to speak for itself. We don't want people coming to our city saying this is when we welcome to Detroit. This is where this is a message. Uh, eyesore. Uh, you know. So we start there. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Well, let me ditto clean for the south. to the other and it doesn't reflect well either so if you could add that to the clean also there's been so many cleanups along the surface I know. Right? I participated in it yeah, yeah. what I have is sort of on that same bent up on Loss earlier it's right more area there's a veterans memorial right in the median mm -hmm. right in Duberton. Well, it's, right. it's falling apart um, I wasn't alive when a lot of those people that commemorates did what they did, but I understand from my father's lessons that we might all be speaking Japanese or German if it weren't for the sacrifice those people made. So I wondered if there's something we can do in the city to restore that. So what we have to do is find out who actually owns and should be maintained because Outer Drive is a county road. So uh, we can get the county commissioner involved in the finding this out. So we'll put that on our list, Danielle. If we can find out if the county commissioner or the city of Detroit who it is, um, and then we'll we'll take it from that point. I have one other thing. So I know they actually did. There was a, a, a part of the, the curb was bumped out uh, not terribly long ago, right along that stretch. I remember. And again, you pass by the, the memorial all the time. And you Wallpaper. Yeah, you, you don't you don't recognize it. And so another that's... issue my neighbor brought up recently, there was a pit bull attacking a mail carrier. Yes. I've trained dogs for sixty years and my late husband ran the canine unit. We used to have a lot of large dogs at home, but I've never allowed one to run loose. But my neighbor brought up a good point. Why don't we have any dog parks, dog runs somewhere in the city, fenced in on maybe on the west side? We used to train our canines at Rouge Park, and when my husband passed, I still trained the body dog because the city didn't have one. But one day I saw a coyote out there bigger than a dog, and I decided, because I wasn't armed, it wasn't a good idea to be out there, but there aren't any available that I know of on the west side other than way out in Green County. Yeah, there, are no, there, there are none that we know of at this point in the west side. There's one in the midtown-ish area. Colin Rose Memorial. Colin Rose that's Memorial. It. Yeah, that's the one I know of. We do need somewhere because you cannot 
safely walk your dog down the street in those neighborhoods. These animals, pit bulls, whatever's running loose, but it isn't safe. And I know my own big dog is a search and rescue dog. I have to run him, but there's nowhere to do it other than on a leash, which isn't really effective in training. But is there a way we could access some of the vacant land that's just sitting there? And... Hold on one second. Well, I only want to say uh, hold on because we are streaming it and we want the folks who are watching. They will say, I can't hear. All right. Uh, straight up Lasher, the old golf course. Mm -hmm. Isn't that city control that now? So yeah, so that we're talking about actually trying to identify what's all going to go up in the, um, the golf course, the Rodale golf course. So that's a possibility. There's also an old canine training field on the roof. Mark that. So, and the other suggestion, Daniela, was the... There's a, was it Detroit, it was a canine training field is out at Rush Park, and that's already a fenced area there near the, near where the barns are, the soldiers. I just, I really think a lot of people I've talked to, they don't let their dogs out of the yard, they can't walk them down the street, so that's one of the reasons a lot of these animals are jumping fences and getting aggressive and wanting to eat people. They're, you know, they've got to get out and run around. That's part of the reason. I think part of the bigger part is, and you hit it on the head uh, when you first uh, uh, open your statements, you're a responsible dog owner. There's a lot of irresponsible dog owners that are out here, and that's part of the issue that we've got to curtail as well. We as city council, and again, we write laws and ordinances, and we created all of these different layers of laws that apply to owners of pets. And the good ones do what you do, and what I do, and what many people in this room do. The bad ones do what you see those others do. They'll lock them up, give them no socialization, or they'll treat them like they're a, a weapon um, to only to protect the house and won't give them any kind of uh, love or any type of uh, companionship. And so we're working on trying to change the behaviors of people as well. But we will take those, at least those two suggestions. Uh, first, Rogel, that's a good idea. I hadn't even thought about that. And then also over at Rouge, those are two large parts essentially that will be able to I think sustain that it's just a matter of what um, the executive branch and the powers that be would like for uh, those places to be yeah. well I mean that's, that's that's government that's the sausage being made unfortunately uh, but we will push push those forward and we'll see what we do thank you hi I'm with community social Hello. with nonprofits. And so I'm out here really in the community trying to find and partner with local um, nonprofits that are looking for retirees um, that could help expand their capacity. And then also those that are retiring that's interested in finding a volunteer opportunity. Uh, because we know that people will volunteer more if they're staying within their neighborhood. So we want to really partner with those local nonprofits that don't even know that we exist. And what we provide is actually mileage reimbursement to retirees if they're volunteering at least 10 hours a month. So how do you get in touch with you? you got to give us some, some numbers and information. So my name is Norvina, N-O-R, V as in Victor, E-N-A, last name Wilson. That's the easy part. My telephone number is 313-883-883. 7764. Again, that's 313-883-7764. So tell us, if you will, about some of the accomplishments and partnerships that you currently already have. Actually, we have partnerships with a number of the large um, museums. So the Henry Ford, um, out in we cover all of Wayne County. Um, so we also have partnerships with Charles Wright Museum, the Detroit Historical Museum. We are about to be into a partnership with the Detroit Public School System um, to try to help them do this big push about their Less Read program because of the third uh, great law reading um, that's coming down the pipeline. So we know we're going to need a number of volunteers. And those volunteers only have to commit to, we're asking for at least an hour a week. Just one hour a week, you can really help DPS and our community and our um, students do a lot. Um, so those are just a handful of the organizations we work with. But if you currently work with a nonprofit, we'd love to talk to you. 
um, as well as um, if you're interested in volunteering once the weather change, we'll love to connect you with some of the local um, nonprofits. Thank you so Great, much. Thanks. Anyone else on this side? Right, so we're going to transition um, before we get on this side of the room. We have uh, representatives from the Detroit Land Bank Authority. If we can give a round of applause for Rod and Rod Lee. And they have a couple words that they want to give to the folks here. Say that. <laughs> Take selfies. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's a mic. This is mine. This is Rodney Wilson, also. I'll be real brief. Uh, I just want to thank Councilman Tate for having us out. Um, we just came from Council President Brenda Jones' coffee hours over in District 7, and Councilman Leland, he stopped by. So we've seen more councilmen before noon today than I have in about three or four months. But we're glad to get the word out about home ownership as well as uh, letting folks know about the programs that we have. If you don't know, the Detroit Land Bank Authority, we oversee the city's residential properties. That includes vacant lots, single-family homes, duplexes, as well as um, four-unit apartment buildings. We auction off four houses every day. We sell hundreds every day through our On and Now program. Uh, this year, we're looking at about 50 to 55 rehab and ready houses. Uh, across the city that will be fully rehabbed. But the main focus we want to talk about is uh, Channel 7 just did a report just a few days ago. Between 2013 and 2018, property values went up 97%. And the good news about that is there's interest, a lot more interest now for our folks to own their own homes. We have some great landlords. We also got some slum guys. And we have folks who they don't keep their properties up. They don't do a good job of taking care of the tenants that pay them rent every month. So what we want to do is encourage home ownership. And I left some cards over on the uh, table, what I call the community table, that a community wall. But we're promoting the open houses coming up this weekend. District 1, um, we have about 10 houses, 8 to 10 houses, that we're hosting open houses on Sunday from 1 to 5. You can go in these houses, you can bring a contractor, because all of our auction owner now properties need work. And we want you to see them before you decide to bid on them, because once you see it, eyes wide open, we have a, a financing page where lenders will work with you. It used to be you had either a loan to buy and a loan to rehab. Now they have combined those, so you'll have one loan, one loan payment. So a lot of new things going on. We have a lot of more things we're also going to start doing our buyer spotlights. Our demographic or our most typical customer is an African-American woman in her 20s, 22 to 25 years old, who's making about 25 to 27,000 a year. So this is not just for men. This is not just for investors. These are folks who live in this city or want to live in this city but own their own home. So again, take a look at the cards. Please visit our website, buildingdetroit.org, because we want to make sure if everyone who wants to buy a house, they have the opportunity to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, oh. Yeah, time to take a few questions. I know typically we have a few land bank questions, sure. and we'd rather do them all at once than sure. keep you here all day. Yes, sir. So I'll give, we'll switch out mics. Oh. Now you can. Get nervous when they tell me to sit down. Strapping me into a lecture chair. Okay, Rodney, here goes. <laughs> oh, yeah, the coat stays on in case you got to make a quick run. It's cold today. I was wondering um, why the city doesn't put a like for sale sign on the front to let people know this is a land bank house if you're interested, call this number because we have several that are just sitting there wide open and um, made a real effort to board things up and they become unboarded, people keep going into them and I mean personally I'm done. Um, and they're nice houses that are just sitting there and, and falling into worse you know, conditions 
But if there was maybe a sign, somebody go, oh, that's a nice little house. This is a nice spot. You know? Yeah, actually, when I first got to the land bank, or the, um, we used to put signs out, but some neighborhoods were saying that that was drawing the wrong kind of attention because you were, you were pretty much telling someone that that house was open. What we're looking it at, is. but what I'm yeah. saying is, they, it took you know, they want to go find a house to do things in, it could be just storing things in there up to dog fighting, illegal sales of drugs, or whatever. What we're looking to do now is. Like these houses, you can come and see them Sunday. They'll be on the website. They'll be available for purchase starting next week. So what we're going to do is, maybe as we start doing the open houses more, we'll start putting the signs on those particular houses. But we didn't want to just put them across the city, every house that we own. And every house that we own, well, two things. It's every vacant ours. house is not ours. No. But the houses that we do own, they need to be cleared as far as title work, because we don't want to sell debt, we want to sell properties. Okay. So we have to make sure all that's cleared because we don't want people having an interest in it and they get excited, but it may not be available until sometime in August. Are we'll they all on the work. list or all the cleared ones all the ones on that are list available are on, the on list. our website okay. right now. Yes. Also, um, they, they tore down most of the um, houses on the block across from where MSU is coming. Yes. But the last three, they, they opened them up, which personally we paid for boards to board up one of them, and the other two were pretty much secured. So they went in, opened them up, put the orange paint on them, and there they are open, and it's like a year later, and nothing is happening. So would the land bank please come and either board them up or yeah, take them down. We can we can get those addresses from you. Okay. And we can have our inspectors go out and assess that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I, I kind of have a part two for Ms. Hanks. Um, your contact information, how she can get in touch with you. Oh, didn't Aaron say that earlier? The, the main the main phone number for the Detroit Land Bank Authority is 313-974-6869, 974-6869. And the best email address is community relations, all one word, community relations at DetroitLandBank.org. This is going to be C-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N-S See, I see, you don't know. I went to Edison. I was the spelling champ two years. And at VTOL. They ain't open no more. So. But also, I didn't know. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. The microphone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My sciatic nerve. Otherwise, I would stand up. I know that's appropriate. So please forgive me. Um, there's property on Joy Row and Manor, between Manor and Metata. It's just a open lot because all those houses are being torn down. How can myself, and then there's a pastor that is interested in purchasing that land, how can we get information on that land? Wait, you mean... Once the houses are demolished? There's no houses there. It's on Joy Road. Oh, this is a straight it's vacant? It's a straight vacant lot. Okay. Down what you can do is have your pastor go to our website. We have what's called the Community Partner Program. We work with faith-based and nonprofits for that purpose. They can get up to nine properties right now that has to be approved by the Land Bank Board. If there's 10 or more properties, there needs to be approval from both the Land Bank Board and City Council. But we're definitely willing to look into that. We have to make sure that we, as the land bank, own all of those properties as well. No, no, but I'm saying, yeah, we, we don't, every vacant lot we don't own, or some, every vacant house we don't own, some are still being owned, they just pay the taxes, they just don't do anything on them. Others may be city owned, they're just not in our inventory yet. I want to piggyback off what she said. Um, we had a, and you work with us, the land bank, off of uh, Minot between School Craft and Kendall. Most of those houses we had demolished within the last two years. It's just one standing. And 
the people in our area, in our block club, we're interested in particularly maybe turning that to a park area. So I did put inquiries on the land, but I was told by um, some members of the Brightmore Alliance that it might not be something that we could, you know, it's like a long process and not just letting the land, like she said, like you have a whole block and you said there's like a limit of two if you're going to do a park for like a whole, that's more than two no, no, no. houses. No, no, no. What I said was, we don't have limits. Oh, what okay. I'm saying is, if you want nine properties or less, it's got to be approved by our board. Okay. If you want ten or more, you need joint approval from both city council and the land bank board. Okay. The only thing I'm concerned about with parks, mm -hmm. and that may be pushed back from the city, is liability. Mm -hmm. That's what he was telling me. Yeah, that, that's because we had people inquire about that before. They want to build a park, and we have a lot of city parks, and I've seen oh, one okay. just even over by miles from Avon. They revamped that. It looks like a whole new place now, the place tapes and everything else. Right. But definitely give us a call. I'll let you make sure I leave my business cards here so that we can discuss that. But yeah, parks is going to be a heavy lift on because of the insurance that will have to go along with that. Now, I haven't filled out the community paperwork as a block club, but I will do that. My other question is in regards to homeowners that purchased the properties. I'm not sure if these were land bank homes or they just purchased the property or whatever, but that been sitting for a while. Because we've had, this past summer, a huge problem with, it was like a group of 30 people come from e course, a part of um, some projects or something closed down, and they just started randomly going through our block club area and finding all the vacant homes and taking them over. So we had like a huge problem going on over there. So what we have is a couple of, you know, after every winter, this cycle starts again. You have an empty house or something like that. There are a couple of houses on our block that I know that they've been purchased. I've kind of randomly, you know, you see someone and you question them, like, did you purchase this house? But then it's sitting there and you know it's over six months, the six month time period. What are the steps? And I know, you know, you guys have so much. Like, are you all following up with these houses? Or? Any property that's bought from the Detroit Land Bank Authority, that buyer must check in every 30 days. Okay. So when you say this group came and just took over, that doesn't sound like customers of the land bank. No, no, no. It's two separate things I was saying. I was saying, you know, we had the problem with the empty houses and right. then these groups of people taking them over. Well, let me, and, just, let me just say for the sake of time, we can look up any address you give us to confirm, first of all, if they're sold by us. Okay. And we can do our due diligence to make sure, but we know that with the recent weather, that the clock will stop on a lot of folks. Some are still trying to get out there with that polar vortex. Right. If it's zero and below zero outside, it's like that on the inside because these don't have heat or electricity. But we can definitely take a look at those who bought properties to make sure that they're keeping up to stay in compliance. There's a lady in the back. One more, I think. Uh, yes, I had the, the house next door to me, a notice was put on there a couple of days ago. Yes. And saying that the land, uh, for the owner to be notified that the land bank will seize this house yes. in three days. Yes. Okay. Now, just as you mentioned about the signage, mm -hmm. because I've run squatters away and I've been trying to keep it where it appears as though, you know, the grass is cut where someone is in there. Yes. But of course we know, as you said, if that sign remains there for too long, that they're going to start going in there. Yes. Now, once that three-day expires, can that sign be taken down? Sure. Because our thing is, we'll have record that we put it up, mm -hmm. and we, we just need to make sure that if somebody rips it off, first of all, they need to let us know, because we want that homeowner to have enough time. That's through our nuisance abatement program. Mm -hmm. We get calls from residents, from law enforcement, from whoever's in that area. Uh, Also issue that on there to contact the owner and let them know they must rehab and re, re, repair that house. You now she'll never see it unless I call her, which I'm going to do. Okay. But during the meantime, who can take that sign down after those three days? Because it says. Well, just let us know that the sign sign has been up and you mm -hmm. would like it removed. We can have somebody come because we just don't want to have somebody. Oh, well, you go tear it down, girl. Go right. That's not ours. No. Okay. We want to make sure they have enough notification because, like I said again. Um, 
if you own a property in this city, mm -hmm. it is your responsibility. I don't care if you're in China, Turkey, right. Greece, or a few blocks away, you are to be checked. Have, and if you can't do it, have somebody check on your property because that's the process. When we get complaints about it, that's the nuisance abatement process that we have in place. So okay. get, get, call our office at that number that I gave out and let them know that the, the poster's been up for okay. at least three days right. and you would like to have it removed. Okay, so not the number that's listed on that poster, but this number that you, you just Either one. It, it both okay. come to the land bank. Okay. That's for them to directly talk to the nuisance abate, abatement division of right. Detroit Land Bank. And I can say Mr. Wilson said that the sign can be taken down. Right? Yes, you can say Mr. Wilson said that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mr. Liggins, but Mr. Wilson's right behind you, so okay. he won't know. Well, then I'll say Mr. Liggins, okay? And that concludes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. This last question. Yes. If you have a home that's on your block and the house caught, this has been going on now for almost two years. We have homes that's been tore down. But if you have a home and it's caught on fire and the people came out and we had it boarded up, it was wide open and it caught on fire, but it remains to be tore down. We've called and asked for it to be tore down, but it's still, and what was told to us is it's owned by someone. They're paying the taxes, but the house, you can kick it and it will fall. Now, who would pay taxes on something like that? And uh, I, I just don't understand why this house cannot be torn down. Here's what I recommend. Contact Building Safety and Engineering. We have, and they've came out, okay. and they have looked at the house, and went around the house, and I don't know if they put note signs, what on the house, but it's still standing. No, what I'm saying is they will let you know if they have what's called imminent danger of demolition, and in need of demolition rather. If they come out, they would tell, we just had one done, and it was done rather quickly, and there were people complaining about it went down too fast. But what I'm saying is, seriously, it's not a truth. It's no windows no, at no. the top, but I it's boarded you. up at the but bottom I, because we right. had it. But what I'm saying is, it's not about just because someone's paying the taxes. If that place is a danger, to that neighborhood or could collapse in itself or on other property, that would be deemed as imminent danger. So if BC has come out, they've done their due diligence on it. I'm not sure that they can just go ahead and say tear it down because then that would fall on that property owner. Now they can be ticketed if they're not trying to rehab it or get it fixed. But if, if they don't and if the owner does not want that property, they can also notify BC and they can move that to be demolished. Because like I said, we do we have auction properties that have fire damage that have been rehabbed, but not every house fits into that category. Okay, you said if the so, owner so, so, does not so, want it. So what I'm going to ask you is Rod and Rodney will be over as, to, to the side because we still have a couple of folks okay. who still have some right. questions. Um, to answer any questions that you may have regarding land bank or clarification on, okay. on your question. Well, what I'm trying to find out is this a land bank problem or is this another problem? So we'll, it all depends on who's like that problem. Somebody paying the taxes, then I'm safe. Yeah. So we'll find that out for you. All right. So, yes, you give it up for Rod Living. All right, so since we are in the clapping mood, Daniela actually has the date, time, and location of the next charter commission meeting. Thank you. So the next charter um, commission meeting is March 12th at Roberto Clemente. Um, the address for that recreation center, so it's taking place in District 6, is 2631 Bagley Street. So it, it is March 12th at Roberto Clemente um, Recreation Center, 2631 Bagley Street, six, and that's in the 6th District. Um, I just realized I don't have the time. 
So I have to find out um, what the time is for that specific meeting, but at least you know the date because that wasn't posted information. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, the so this wasn't posted information, so I had to get it, but now I realize I don't have the time. So we have the date and the location, so it's March 12th. Okay, so we'll, what we'll do is uh, do our best to put the time out. How many of you receive our text messages, Facebook, alerts, emails? We'll work to get that information out at the next time. Um, so I should just keep that in mind, communication manager. All right, so... Now we're going to transition to our first Friday interview. All right. So uh, coming up is a gentleman who I have known for a number of years. Um, when I worked at the police department for five years, I was there. I went across a whole bunch of folks who I had a lot of love, respect, and admiration for. Um, but there are some that completely go above and beyond the, the call of duty. And he was always sharp, too, every time you see him. And he has kept that tradition to this day. He's no longer a member of the truck police department, but he's actually an investigator for the Wayne County Medical Examiner. Um, so you can only imagine the stuff that he's seen over his career and the things that he's currently um, seen in his new career as an investigator with the Wayne County Medical Examiner. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can give a round of applause in the way that we do in D1 and welcome Mr. Dale, Investigator Dale Collins. Yeah, just smooth. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Appreciate it. Let me have a seat, please. How's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Dale. I'm an investigator with the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office. Now, Ask me how did I qualify or how did I prepare myself for that job? Do you want to know? Yeah, yeah. In 71, I joined the police department, the Detroit Police Department. I started at the 10th precinct. I moved over to plain clothes and I started working up liquor, gambling, and vice. I then went to um, the vice section downtown where I handled the whole city as for the um, after our jobs prostitution, gambling. Then I went to organized crime, where we followed gangs that uh, did smash and grab. They would go to a, a bank, throw a, send a block through the window and take, take the jewels. From there, I went to homicide, where I spent 27 years uh, investigating uh, fatal shootings. Um, so there, um, I have a lot of stories to tell, but um, I can think of one um, that comes to my mind right away, the one on Runyon where there were four people killed in a household Runyon on the east side. Um, and um, the investigation turned into some problems for the city because the person that was charged, later on down the line, he was exonerated. And, of course, the city had to pay some money, which... Uh, these things do happen sometimes, but yeah, and there was a there was a hitman involved as well. Remember that part? There, there was a hitman. He uh, he would kill dope men. As a matter of fact, when he when he was brought into the homicide section, he said his job was robbing dope houses and killing dope men, and that's what he did. He was a little guy, a little smaller than me, but I mean, he was like cold blooded, vicious. Now, another thing in my career, I I've been a victim myself. And a lot of us have been victims in different areas. I was robbed or attempted. Somebody attempted to rob me, but I killed both of them. So, you know, they, they, they're paying right now. But as I said, the thing is, so this is what has prepared me for the job that I'm doing now is to investigate that death. Now, when I left the police department in 08, I went to the attorney general's office. I was a special agent for uh, Bill Shoot. So I worked for the state of Michigan. And I had the opportunity to work on the uh, fungal meningitis outbreak that occurred in, 20, in, in 12, where a guy by the name of Barry Catton, out of New England, he shipped four lots of tainted steroids nationwide. Michigan was hit the hardest. We lost 59 people died, and they gave out over 1,000 epidural shots. And when you get an epidural shot, if anybody knows, it's the pain, but it will change your whole life. A lot of people couldn't walk, couldn't talk, had hallucinations. Now, that investigation came to a close when we locked up 14 people. Now, the feds had their end. And after the feds 
were through with their investigation, two of those people are here now, Gary Cadden, they're getting ready to go on trial for 59 counts of murder in, 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 in Michigan. In Michigan alone? In Michigan alone. Wow. So after that, um, three years ago, I joined the medical examiner's office. And um, I investigate unnatural death. So that means I respond to any death scene where it's an unnatural cause. Uh, also respond to homicides. And I see the officers are here today. They, What they do, they make the scene first. And then I get a call. We come to remove the remains. So when I come to the scene, I have to uh, document, take photographs, talk to uh, witnesses. Now, one of the hardest parts in this job is to uh, get the person identified. to be able to, uh, you know, talk around and talk that stuff. So eventually they may tell you, you know, what you need to know. Now the information that I gather, it's put in the report and it's given to the pathologist uh, at the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office. And what they do is they determine manner and cause of death. Now a lot of deaths are released right at the home and a lot of people don't know that. If your loved one passed and they had a history of um, hepatitis, hypertension, glaucoma, what would happen is that they would talk to an investigator at my office, it might be me, and I talk to the officer, he tells me basically what kind of medication they take, I need to know their age, and based on age and your medical history, you can about tell if it's a natural death. Now if it's a natural death, I have the authority to release that case to the family, they have to notify their funeral director to come pick their loved one up. Now see, a lot of people, they, you know, they don't know that because I mean, death is ultimate, and we all gonna go that way. We don't want to go that way. I don't want to go that way, but it's gonna happen. And it's hard to, you know, just to really um, cope with it. So I've, I've gone to scenes. Matter of fact, I worked midnight last night. I went to two scenes last night. Uh, one was uh, on the street called Mark Twain. A young lady was a lady was driving her vehicle with her kids on, on a large freeway. She felt um, like she was hearing voices, and she. Lost control, crashed into the wall, and she was able to drive the kids home. But when she got there, she became unresponsive and she collapsed in the floor. So um, I had to go out there and we brought her in. She's on our docket for the day, so the doctors were turning uh, cause of death. And the family, I saved them a trip from coming to the medical examiner's office because what we carry, we carry identification cards. If I can get a person to sign that card, it'll save them a trip from coming to our office. And all they have to really do is sit down and uh, with their funeral director, and they can be removed. But as I said, my job is um, it's kind of it's kind of tough, you know, because when you see kids that uh, pass and in hospitals, you have you have uh, parents that um, they have they sleep with a child in the bed. You're not supposed to sleep with a child in the bed. So a lot of them roll over on the child. The child is what, about three or four months old. And that child passes. So we bring all those cases in. We bring in all trauma cases. And trauma means if, if I um, hit you on your leg and you have a mark, that's trauma. So we will bring that case in to, for our doctors to look at uh, in the morning. And invest investigation is start or inspection is started by the doctors at 8.30. And by 12 o'clock, we'll have a manner and cause of death. So Jim, let me, let me ask you a question. What, what does your typical day look like? I mean, you wake up in the morning, and then... Well, when I wake up in the morning, uh, I'm preparing to go to work, really. I mean, I have breakfast, I kiss my wife, uh, call my daughter, she lives in Indianapolis, and see how she's doing, and then I, she said, well, where are you going? I said, I'm getting ready to go to work. So when I get to work, you never know what you're going to be doing. So you might be in the office fielding phone calls, death calls. We feel death calls from the whole county of Wayne. Hospitals call us on a death call. We get the officers calling on a death call, and we get nursing homes, assisted living, so you really never know what you're gonna be doing, so you just have to be prepared. I'm a little sleepy now, but I'm looking at you guys, and I'm happy because I'm here with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is the, so you do all of the, what is the typical day, what time? After midnight, if we're short, a person might call up. People get they get a little upset about death sometimes, so that somebody they can't handle it. So therefore, they they call off. So that means 
the lower seniority person will have to stay. I mean, I don't mind staying. I mean, I try to do, uh, uh, my boss is Al Samuels. He used to be DPD before he took over at the, uh, at the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office. Constant take note. When I worked at Homicide, I worked uh, under Gil Hill. And he, you know, he rose to uh, council president. So, you know, I, I've been around some people that have given me a lot of information and some of the skills that I possess, I get them from other people. I got, I'm looking at you guys now and I'm picking up a few things from you. I look at one person, I see this, I look at another person. And all these things go into being an investigator. You want to find out what the problem was. You want to find out so the doctors can determine cause of death. Now, the... The most, the hardest things that go to are those decomposed bodies. You get a person, and this is another thing, a family would not see their loved one for like eight or nine months. And so they're home, they're by themselves, the neighbor might say, well, hey, I haven't seen Mr. Robinson in three weeks. So they'll do, they'll, they'll call the police department and they'll, what they call a well-being check. They go in, flies flying around, the person is on the floor, he's, you know, it's, uh, he's bloated. Uh, skin slippage. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bad thing. Yeah, they don't even look the same. Though. They don't look the same. You, you won't even know them. So therefore, we, we bring them down. All decomposed come to the officer because, number one, they might be shot. You won't know because decomposition can fool you. So therefore, those cases all come to court. And in the summertime, they're really rough because if it's 90 degrees uh -huh. and you go to a scene like that, number one, flies all over the wall. There are dogs in the house. The dogs probably didn't eat the other dog up. I mean, this is this some gruesome stuff. So, so let me let me ask you this: How you've been doing this for how many years again? Uh, homicide, just about. Well, homicide. I worked homicide, homicide for twenty-seven years. I right, said so twenty-seven years. I mean, you can only imagine how many of those horrific scenes you've uh, experienced over your, your your career. How do you turn it off? Turn it on? What's your motivation? Well, my motivation is, I believe that nobody has a right to take anybody's life. I take it personal when that happens. So therefore, I want to do everything I can to find out who. And the only way you can find out is that you have to have help. People in the, the neighborhoods have to help. If a guy get killed down the street from you and you don't step up, it's going to make the killer stronger. So he's going to do the same thing again. So therefore, I understand sometimes it But that's something that we have to do. Either we live in fear and I don't want to live in fear. So it's, it's, it's a tough decision to make, but we cannot do this job by ourselves. We need the community. It's a, but it, you know, it's, it's again a tough, tough job. And the stuff that you've had to see over your career, does, does some of that stuff stick with you? And how do you sleep at night? I mean, that's, that's the human part of this thing. You're still a human. Even yeah. though you have a profession and you care, but as a human being, how do you deal with that? And, and do you come home and decompress with your family? Well, the man upstairs helped me, and 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 uh, I um, it, it, I'm not saying it don't bother me, but I can deal with it where I go to sleep. I sleep pretty well. I very rarely I don't dream about these scenes. And if you see something horrific, and it may be in your mind for a while, everybody's not strong. I I think the man gave me some strength. Put it like that. So therefore, I can I can hang. Put it like that. I can hang. And uh, one day I'm I'm gonna give it up and let somebody else do. It. But right now I'm in it for you. <laughs> uh, any questions? So let me let me ask you this. So when you first joined the police department, what was your motivation to join? Nineteen seventy one. So that's got you started along this trail. You didn't. Uh, you didn't. I'm sure didn't join and be a part of homicide and see bodies every day. Well, what was your motivation to join the police department? Well, actually, somebody else motivated me. A friend of mine was a police officer, and uh, he kept telling me, "Dale, you should join the police department." I said, man, I know too many motherfuckers doing so and so and so. I don't join no police department. But he said, let me ask you this. He said, are they paying your bills? Are they putting food on your table? I said, no. He said, you need to go down and, and join that bad boy because we need some black officers. Because, see, back then, there wasn't many. And uh, I worked at the 10th Precinct, and it was rough in the 10th Precinct. I mean, you had YBI, you had... Uh, uh, you had uh, Thelmine Stuckey, who was the Puritan Avenue boys, and he was killing a lot of people. But I tell you one thing, and don't get me wrong, I don't care for killers, but some of those guys, they have respect for people. They didn't shoot up houses like they do today and shoot a little baby or mama knitting. They didn't do that. If you're wrong, they come and get you and take you out. You, you might be found out on the freeway in the weeds out there on 94. 
But that's how it was then. But now there's no respect in that game. There's none at all. And it, it's scary. But we still have to step up. We have to. Because if you don't, we lost. And there's some ways that you can for those who are maybe watching on this, the stream. There's ways that you can uh, reach out to authorities with, and, and anonymously. It's 1-800-SPEAK-UP. And we know we say it all the time. And there's a lot of people who don't believe that it's really anonymous. But it really is. Now, they're saying, well, I don't want to get involved because I may have to testify before them in court. And then now they know me. They know my family. That's right. How do you, how do you combat that as an investigator? I know you've had people who've had that experience and have told you that before. Well, you have to go out and talk to them. You, you tell them. That, and if a person believes you, they will do something for you. So you have to convince them. You have to push that button. And I'm a button pusher. I get a lot of people to tell me what happened or who killed so-and-so and so-and-so. But now... With the video cameras, that helps. The Up on Greenfield on Six Mile Road, two guys robbed the old man who was playing his lotteries, sitting in the car. He walked up to him, told him, "Give me the money." The guy said, "Man, I don't have no money. I'm trying to catch the number. I'm gonna count to three, and I'm gonna shoot you if you don't give me give me the money." And they shot him. But there was a camera at that store. And we got the video, downloaded it, and I put it on TV. I get a call at the office from a young lady. She said, uh, Detective Collins, my brother was out there, but he didn't shoot nobody. I said, well, if he didn't shoot nobody, his ass need to talk to me. I need to find out where he was. And so she told me where he lived at, but she wanted to be there because she said she didn't like the police, and she figured that we might do something to her. I said, well, you can be there. Be in the kitchen somewhere. So we went to the location. He was not there. His mother was there. And I told him, I said, ma'am, I said, your son was involved in a murder. We have him on tape. I said, and we have 5,000 people, 5,000 police look at him. He needs to turn himself in. How would you get in contact with him? She said, well, I don't know. But there was a young lady who stayed down the street that knew me. And she saw me when I walked to the car. And so she was like my eyes and ears in that neighborhood, right off of Connor by the airport. She called me when she saw the guy. I sent some guys from the ninth precinct and they locked him up. And from that lockup, we were able to identify the rest of the guys that were in that van. So, you know, you need help. So some of that help, you just talked about the cameras that are out there. And now you have, you know, criminals who are filming themselves doing right. the crimes and basically telling on themselves. What other technology or any other tools, new tools that have helped uh, solve homicide crimes in particular. Well, basically, they say, I, I like uh, speak up. I like the we, they pay you a little money because see, money talks. The other stuff is a motivator. You know. So I think it should be more than a thousand dollars. I mean, if if we out cross eight mile road somewhere, uh, the money is bigger. I don't know why our money isn't bigger. It should be, and and people will talk, and they can be anonymous, and and uh, they don't have anything to worry about. But you have to convince them of that. And once that's done, you. Can the case. I've closed cases that were 10 years old because the case was cold for a long time, but then we got a piece of information. The guy was locked up. I get a call from the guy that I had locked up that I gave him his, his respect. He said, well, that guy Collins, he all right. They would call you and say, man, that little boy that got killed over on what street, so-and-so and was out there, and they did that. I go lock that guy up, and you'd be surprised. At it. And so we had to also, and I told Kim Worthy one day when I was in the office, I said, Kim, I said, you know what? We can close a lot of cases with the good people, well, we have to go on the side of the dark side, guys, and work with them also. And a lot of them, they do have conscience, some of them, and they will help you. There might be a couple of gangsters up in here, I don't know. <laughs> watch them. You, 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 you never know. You, you never know. Or, or they know one. Everybody knows somebody. Everybody. And, that, and that's what we always tell folks. We have what's called the D1, D1 CAM, District 1 Community Accountability Network. And we uh, focus on how do we try to reduce gun crimes in District 1 first and then City of Detroit. And that is exactly what we say. It is not just police responsibility. It's not just city council or the mayor. It's all of our responsibility because the shooters live in somebody's family, in somebody's household. They know somebody. And so they will listen to you quicker than they'll listen to me or maybe even Detective Collins. So uh, for we, we, we always want to keep that out there, that we all have a responsibility, whether you're in the neighborhood, 1-800-SPEAK-UP. Whether you're in the family, you need to talk to them. 
And if you are in government, we need to figure out how to provide the resources to the individuals who are out there doing those investigations. My last question, and I'll open up for uh, the audience, is, you know, we have this perception. Everybody's tough nowadays, right? They're real tough guys. And, uh, they commit crimes. It's brazen. It's just stupid crime. The guy just shooting somebody, shooting on the freeway and kill a three-year-old. I mean, yeah, just, that, that just, was tragic. Just hideous. Wow. Um, and they're tough, right? What happens in that interrogation room? Well, the interrogation room is a place you don't want to be. Now, back in my day when we were doing it then, I mean, you go in there, you spend hours with a person. I might start talking to the person and they'll take me, for instance, they'll take me up on the porch. They go into they they're getting ready to go in the house. So the next person going to talk to them, you have to make sure that they don't let them get back on the ground. So what you do, you tell them where you're at and they continue. Now I've gotten many, many, many confessions, but it's a team effort at that office. And we stay up all night, go home, change clothes, come right back. So it it's uh, interrogation and interview are two different things. Once you know that person did it, you look them in the eyes and you tell them See, you know they're messed up inside because they are. And they know it. But then if you push that right button, a lot of times they will tell you, even people that were locked up that don't talk, that they like something about you, they may tell you something that might help you out. So it's always, and Gil Hill told me, he said, man, you got to respect these people. I don't care who they are, whether they're blind, cripple, crazy, prostitute, or what else. You know, you have to, you have to really, and I'm sorry, I have to get down. I tell it like it is because that's the way life is. That's how it is. All right. So, we have any questions for investigative comments? Anyone? Oh, please, please. come on. So, I'll switch my <laughs> Taking the mic. Take it, bro. <laughs> Thank you. You hit on a key point about Speak Up. Is that a nonprofit? How, how is that funded? No, no. Let's do Crime Stoppers. Has it been $1,000 for like years now? To me, the, um, the price has not gone up. Like I said, I think it should be more. I think if there's more money, yeah. people will step up. I mean, I mean, a thousand dollars will help out, but I mean, you need five thousand. I've seen a crime that happened out in the suburb. They already had eight thousand uh, dollars raised in about, you know, a few days. But maybe they have more money. I don't know. But they, it should be more. So they start with the one thousand dollars flat. And what will happen is corporations, individuals will then say, well, you know what, it was so terrible, I also want to add some money. So that do those dollar amounts go up. Okay. Typically, again, in suburban communities, communities, because it's shocking and it's something that's terrible, we don't want to happen again. Um, and they have resources that some of our folks in the city don't have. So that's why you traditionally see, and this is, from my conversation that I've had with Crime Stoppers, that's why you traditionally see the flat 1,000. Once in a while you see them jump up 5,000, sometimes even 10, but it really has to be a horrific, terrible crime, and uh, one where you have people who feel that I have no other obligation but to try to get it. So I would offer this one, one su suggestion from your office, if it's possible to get empirical data from the Crime Stoppers in those other, in those other areas, in regards to those tips and how many cases have been closed based on how much money was like out there. And perhaps you can encourage some corporations, um, perhaps downtown, since we have so, so, so many corporations moving downtown, to possibly contribute more to those funds. Um, in the guise that that's gonna in turn hopefully reduce crime using those, up, those other areas as, as examples. Um, the other question I have is a matter of how do you speak to witnesses and folks in regards to culture? And the reason being is that the shooting that was on Southfield Freeway, some of the base that I was reading on social media wasn't that it was a shooting that happened, period. It's that the person wasn't intending to shoot that child. You know, and I'm like, well, okay, so you chase down, you pull out a gun. It's so many actions that go before that. It's like, oh, you, you know, like, well, you know, he shot the mom, would, you know, would, would have been all right. So when you're out here in the, in the streets, do you have those those conversations? I mean, are, are folks so desensitized by, like, crimes and murder where it just doesn't, you know, I don't know if they, you know, they hear it, you know, so so often that it, you know, just just doesn't hit home? 
if if I see someone in the street that I know and I know they they dirty or they wrong, I mean I talk to them. I tell them, man, you need to get your stuff together and get you a job. I mean I do that, but sometimes a lot of people they don't heed that. But I also talk to people and tell them, you have to be aware of your surroundings when you're out. When you come out your door, when I come out of my house, I go to the front door first and I look to see if I see any cars or something I don't know. And I tell my wife the same thing, although sometimes she don't look. She just walks well, outside door and go shopping. But see, it's in, it's in my blood. It's not in her, so I understand it. But we should be more aware because right now they run up and bring you back in the house, rob you, shoot you, and most of the time you don't know what they're going to do. Like in my situation, I'm right there on Seven Mile at the Omni Party Store, right there at Lager. And I parked my car. I'm getting ready to go down to the club, right? So I go in the store. These guys see my car. And that's what they wanted, my car. So they followed me. And they went into the park. And they waited for me to go into the store. And then they waited for me to come out. But I took a long time. So what they did, they backed up right in front of the door and pulled back on the side of the street. That's when I was coming out. So when I walked to my car, a young lady pulled up with her fella and a little boy in the car right next to me, we crossed paths. She was going in the store. I was coming out. I reached for my door, and a guy said, hey, MF, give it up. You know what time it is. Now, I look and see him over my left shoulder. He running at me like that from the street side. So I pulled my weapon, and I fired six. He fired one. He went down. When I saw him on the ground, and I didn't tell him a lie. I walked up to him, and I said, die, MF. You know, because I was, I was mad. I mean, you know, come on. The second guy, he turned the vehicle around, went to the east side, they burned it up. But what you do in that investigation, the first thing you do is you get with the family of the dead person. They told that he was with so-and-so and so-and-so. We ended up locking up that guy in about a week. Now, that's when I was with the Attorney General's office. I was the first Attorney General agent to ever be involved in a federal shooting in Michigan. They didn't know what to do. So I, I called the guys at Homicide, brought all the reports to them, and we... Like I said, we closed it. They closed the case. They did a good job. I they did a good job, I must say. But, but you never know. No more? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. You did a very good job. Before you leave, I have one last. Danielle, do you have one? I think Danielle has one over here. My question is, um, how much longer do you plan on um, being in this role, or are you planning to move on to something else? My daughter, she lives in Indianapolis, Indiana. I have a grandson, 16. He, uh, he just turned 16 the other day. He gets all A's. He plays baseball, football, golf. He do it all, and he's bad. She wants to say, why don't you retire and come and move here? I said, what am I going to do? You're going to give me a job at Walmart, be a, a security <laughs> guard? <laughs> and, and, and she fall out. <laughs> so my thing is, I'm going to retire when, it, when, I, when I get ready to. Then I'll, I'll move on. Then I'll move on. Because people ask me that all the time. Man, you tired of working? You tired of homicide? You tired of them dead bodies? When you going to retire? I said, when I get ready. And that's what I'm going to do. Just like uh, Councilman Tate, he's going to leave when he gets ready. <laughs> <laughs> After you take care of you guys. There you go. So, are, uh, two, one, two last things. Are you training, because you've got a lot of experience, and you tell it like it is, you've seen it like it is, are you training anyone to follow your footsteps? Because there will be a day when you do decide to hang it up. Well, what we do at our office now is we bring in PAs, and we bring in new people, and they shadow. And what's the PA? The what's the PA? Uh, I'm a personal um, attendant, and uh, and we have the uh, young ladies and young fellows that come in. They want to be investigators in, in in these offices, so they go out with us on scenes. They get to do, they get to do the reports. It's just like in the police department. I mean, they have programs where you can uh, be in some kind of cadet program if you want to be a police officer. We do the same thing there. And I I always like I said I I've been I've uh, spoke at uh, Wayne State. Uh, I I present our office, um, we do the uh, seminar every year at the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office. We have uh, pathologists, police officers, civilians, students that come in for a four-day seminar. And I, I present the homicide in because, you know, I work the homicide. But I present the homicide as we work with the investigators at the ME's office. 
I mean, you have to work. Teamwork will get you everywhere, just like community. Teamwork is what gets you over. You can't do nothing by yourself. That's right. Try to borrow a dollar and you ain't got nobody to go to. <laughs> so, my last is, is actually not really a question. It's, I want you to finish this, this sentence. At the end of my career, I hope that I will have done my job and brought some closure to some families that uh, needed that for them to go on with their life. And then I'll be happy. And my daughter will be happy too because I'll be gone. Right. Y'all give it up for us here, Dale Collins. Yeah. So now we're going to begin again on this side with our Q and A, our questions. I see Delta Sigma Theta in the house. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Andrea Cartwright, and I am with um, Delta um, Sigma Theta Sorority of the Detroit Alumni Chapter. Um, our sorority house is at Seven Mile and Grand River, and uh, we will be hosting um, our fifth annual award-winning expungement clinic um, and second, um, second Chance Fair on April the 27th from 9 a.m. to 3 uh, p.m. Um, and um, as indicated, it is our fifth annual, and the purpose of the expungement fair um, is to give returning citizens a second chance. Um, um, when a returning citizen um, um, has basically... Um, to um, getting jobs, um, housing, it affects their lives as well as their families. And so this is an opportunity um, to give back to the community. And uh, we will have some flyers within um, the next couple of weeks that I will provide to the um, councilman's office to share with um, the different organizations. Thank you. Thank you. And it's a Saturday. Um, um, April the 27th from 9 to 3 p.m. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, Ms. Carter, did you bring any files or literature with you so I could share two or three people that didn't um, do it last year? Yeah, we do not have our flyers out as yet. Okay. We will be getting them this week. Okay. Um, and so as soon as I do, I will be providing some here okay. at the Java House as well as to the councilman. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Any other questions? Moving on this side of the room now. Are there any uh, questions, concerns, compliments, ma'am? Uh, yes, ma'am. I don't know if any, I was late. I don't know if anyone else has inquired regarding the status of the rental ordinance for zip code 48219. No one has asked. Mm -hmm. We'll have to get you that information. Hello. Um, I met with a nice young man from the Detroit Historical um, Society. That's in, they're located in the museum downtown, and I told him I would announce. The microphone close to I would announce this um, at the meeting. His name is William Winkle, and they're trying to um, gather. I think he said a thousand oral histories of Detroit. My husband and I met with him, and he asked us questions and recorded it. He was very respectful. So if anyone's interested in uh, doing that, it's going to contribute, I guess, to the history of Detroit. Um, you can call him at, it says P, oh, phone, 313-833-7912. It's called, I believe, the Detroit History Project. Um, and I had two questions. Well, and also there's a Wayne County meeting coming up at WC3 on Outer Drive. And one of my pet peeves is the houses that the, they're selling, the tax foreclosure houses. And, we have, and they're just ruining our neighborhoods the way they're conducting it. So I plan to go there and confront them with that because 
Um, our block is, we've got two that are really uh, doing a job on our block. So if you're interested, you can look up under Wayne County. I'm sorry, I should have brought that with me. but. Um, and then I want to know, is it legal to use a house for storage in Detroit? Rodney brought that up, that some people buy them just for storage. Do you know, Councilman Dave? No, it is not. Well, we have one. Well, let me just say this. So the answer is yes and no. So if it's inside and it's contained, and it's a home that's up, and the taxes are up, no issues, um, there's no fire hazard, then yes, you can use it for that because it's just a home that's being used for those kind of purposes. But when you start talking about hazardous materials, isn't happening. Let me just put it that way. Well, and, no. and his taxes are under $100 a year. And I don't get that at all. So, you know, and I've been reporting this house for four years. It's not kept up. It's been broken into. And nothing, he gets ticketed, I guess. So, so you did pass that information on before that about that particular I, I don't know if I have to you, but I've done it with the city several times. So. Okay, so if we can get that information to Daniela, we'll, okay. we'll follow up and get you some kind of information on it. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. There was one regarding the rental ordinance as well. I didn't hear that one. That was for you. So what's the answer, Aaron? Yeah, you can call me up here. Aaron Hall. Regarding the, rent, the status of the rental ordinance uh, for 48219, it was uh, everyone was supposed to be uh, certified by December 1st. Mm -hmm. And where could I find information on, um, on the status of the houses for rent in 48219, particularly in my community? Are up to date? So you're looking for to, to find out about the inspections themselves or which homes are or, rent? Or where they should be. Hold the mic up one more time. Oh. I can hear you. I'm sorry. To find out if the houses are where they should be according to the ordinance. So that will be building and safety. I do know that they've had more challenges than they anticipated in implementing this. So they have um, extended the, the rollout deadline uh, based mm -hmm. upon the fact of their in investigators, their inspectors, excuse me, not having um, enough manpower. So that's a, a major issue that they found out. And again, here we are now about to enter the budget session um, and that's a two-month process, and we're going to find out how many, because we, we approved this ordinance, and you said you had the, what you needed, and so now we're being told that they don't have exactly what they need. So we're going to be following up, but building and safety, um, we can get a phone number for, for you for the individual, maybe even Latrice, I know she was here earlier, is she still here? She take off? So maybe she, she may have some information on it before she gets out of here. But yeah, that's the extent of my information I can provide. Can you take the mic? So was that a good interview? Dale Collins? Yeah. My goodness. So we've done some of you, uh, Latrice, if you come for a second. Some of you remember, so we've been doing this for a while now. We've had a linesman. You remember that guy who came and talked about how he have, uh, almost electrical. Well, he was electrical. He didn't die. So, yeah. So he didn't. He didn't. He didn't die. He was electrocuted. Um, a lot. A lot. And and held up yeah. as well. Yeah. And so that's something we don't think about. We had an individual from the water department talk about some of the things that they go through over there. We had a firefighter uh, who is uh, on the end of his career and looking to now go into the next phase and sell T-shirts and apparel. Uh, we had an individual. What else did we have? Give us some more. I know. Animal control. We had the dog catcher. Yeah, you know? yeah, that was the last one we had. Who else did we have? All right, so I guess we don't know. But head fire department. We had somebody else. I know it was one other person we had. Animal control. Oh, uh, the 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 uh, guy who uh, the, the trash collector. Advanced disposal. That's it. I knew it was one more. It was an individual. And we did say the water department. There's an uh, individual who uh, collects the trash. And again, these are 
The reason why we do this is we want to humanize these positions. We think that these folks are robots, as you saw. You know, he, right. they'll told it like it is, but you got to be somebody who can tell it like it is to see this stuff on a regular basis. And you can only imagine. And so these are positions and jobs in many situations that many of us would not want to have, but we're glad, we're thankful that somebody is doing it. Uh, I can only imagine what life would be like if we didn't have people like Dale who are out there on a regular basis looking out for us, um, whether it's a family member or the actual deceased. So um, we're going to continue to have a series of these interviews uh, every first Friday. That's our goal. And if you have any suggestions as well, send them our way because we want to make sure this is not just something that we come up in our office. Uh, we want to provide what you believe is informative, um, but also just something you can share with uh, your neighbors as well. So Latrice, before we go to you, so Latrice, we had a question about the rental um, property inspections, of specifically 48219. I know that there was a talk about expansion uh, of the deadline due to the capacity of the manpower. Do you have any information on that at all? So yes, uh, so we did extend the deadline. Uh, it's actually live right now on 48219, but there's a little bit of leniency because there are so many uh, I guess issues and things they had to work through as far as the kinks with the program. Um, but you can go on our website, City of Detroit, uh, I think it's just slash rental registration, and get all the information if you guys have received a ticket. Um, I guess I would have to know what your specific issue is or question, and I can get you to the right person um, to assist you with that. So before you leave today, if that's your question, come see me. But you can always check our website out. It will show you, uh, we are ex uh, extending it to other zip codes, uh, but we're, everything is kind of delayed by, I believe, about 60 to 90 days um, as we're trying to uh, give people a chance to get their properties compliant. So, uh, oh, okay. for those of you who may or may not know, this is Latrice McClendon. I didn't need to do, give her the proper introduction. And she's the district manager in District 1, so she's essentially the eyes and ears of the administration in District 1, but also someone who lives in District 1, so she cares as I well. Uh, so any, um, right now, questions since she's up here, any questions at all for Latrice? And if not, Latrice, what's that information if someone wants to give yeah, you touch so with you? Because there's folks who are like, streaming as well watching. Oh, great. So you can give me a call at 313-236-3484. Again, my name is Latrice McClendon. Um, you can also reach out to my deputy. Her name is Kaya Roberson. So if you can't get in contact with me, uh, her phone number is 313-236-3473. And basically, we can answer any of your questions. We're a liaison to the different city departments. If you have, if you're having any blight issues within your community, uh, you have questions about your, I don't know, it could be about water or DTE, or uh, maybe you just need to know how to solve an issue. Uh, we can definitely help you with that. And um, if you want to know who your uh, NPO, we have some NPOs here, but we can help you with that. So whatever your question is, we can pretty much get you to the right person. So I've noticed, just confirmation, so I've noticed in our neighborhood there are a lot of houses that have been stripped of the siding and uh, they have either orange or red writing on them. So is the next step when possible that those houses will come down? Yeah, that's like in preparation for uh, demolition. And so we are, like there's demolition happening in District 1, so it's not, unlike, yeah. like, it's not unlikely that you would see uh, the writing and the postery right now in District 1. I think right now we've been in Brightmore. Like it's kind of been a concentrated area. So um, yeah, we are taking down houses. Anything else you want to let folks know Just... Uh, you know, hopefully you guys are uh, connected uh, with our mailing list, our email list, uh, to just stay abreast of all of the different events that we have coming up. Uh, Grand River is getting a makeover, as I call it, and so there has been a series of community meetings where uh, you can kind of give your input about what you, you know, like how you think Grand River should look, do you want violence, do you not? We've, we're past some of those meetings, but we have a few additional meetings coming up, so if you're on the mailing list, if you're not, you can go to our City of Detroit website and put, uh, hit subscribe, enter your email address, and you'll be sent information specific to your zip code or your district. Um, other than that, if you guys have questions, I'll be hanging around for a little bit here. And um, as always, it's a pleasure to 
uh, be with the with Councilman Tate and his team. He's an amazing council member, and um, I had a chance to work with him. He'll confirm that. Yeah, and I mean that genuinely. He knows that, so I'm not just saying that because I have the mic. And his people, they okay. No, they're great too. All his people are great. Um, so thank you for having me and let me talk. And I appreciate it. Uh, I know that there were some folks who had some questions and concerns about some of the apps. Uh, do we have any information on that at all? Okay, because I know some of the apps were acting, they were acting up. They wouldn't allow some of the improved Detroit, didn't allow some of the prompts. Uh, some of them were moved and removed, and even the uh, Detroit police app. Uh, what's the name of that one again? DPD Connect. DPD Connect. I know there was an issue there as well. Rich? Oh. I got an email back from Amber Easton from IT. Um, she says, no changes have been made to the improved Detroit app. She searched Apple and Google Play stores and found the app there available. She sent me some screenshots of the actual uh, fact that the app had been updated on Google Play stores. Flyers. Did they replace it with anything? Sorry. She said she reached out to the technical team at Public Safety uh, just a couple of days ago, actually, to confirm if they intend to update it. And her point of contact is currently on vacation. So as soon as they have an answer, they will let us know. But as of this point, the DPD Connect is not active. So we will be uh, making updates to our flyers relative to that. Okay. So she did tell you that there were no updates. We know that there was an update. So there was some issues with improved Detroit app. Uh, the way that we found out is because residents started to tell us that the same thing that they were uh, for years using and the prompts that they were using are no longer on the apps. We'll get to the bottom of it and find out. Again, this is budget season. So we have an opportunity to dig a whole lot deeper than we typically do. Uh, anything else for the Greater Goods team? Uh, we know we have our D1 monthly meeting coming up. We don't have a location yet. Do we? Haven't secured it yet. But it's the fourth Saturday. March 12th. 3rd, Saturday, 10 a.m. Okay. All right, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for attending another District 1 Satellite Hours. Give yourself a round of applause. God bless and stay warm. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. I saw the lamb at Take care. Real quick before they go. Live tonight. See y'all at six o'clock. All right, say one more time. Don't be mad because you missed it. Jazz or Java, six o'clock. Okay. Everybody go for one second, please. Excuse me, one second, one second, one second. Yeah, one second. We're gonna pause. We're gonna pause. Then we're gonna pause. All right, Kevin Kev. Come. Shh. Thank you, Miss Alicia. <laughs> 6 p.m. The door is open. The music will be playing. The food will be here. The energy, the love will be here. Come blow us off. We got the weekend now. But come and support us. Uh, let's all get together on our common ground music. Have a good time. And I'll see y'all at 6 o'clock. And it's free 99. You can't beat the price. Okay. This is for you, so come on and get it. Thank you. Last time I came here, you did a cipher at the piano, remember? And we might just do another one. Yeah. And wait a minute. So nice. We actually rehearsed for this one. Oh. oh. We don't do that. Ask your mom. Ask your mom. Ask